Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. We are continuing our examination of the challenge of Christ. And I, I, I just have to tell you that the more I examine, the more I think about, the more I research this challenge of Christ, the more I realize, number one, how distinctive it is. Just recently, I was watching a YouTube video uh, with a very, very noted uh, modern apologist. I think I better turn my phone off here just in case. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, and this individual, if I'm not mistaken, it was Gary Habermas, a fantastic scholar. Pardon me, uh, probably the world's leading scholar on the reality of Jesus's resurrection. And I, I believe it was Habermas. But anyway, the scholar that I was watching said, when, when it comes to the nature of Christianity, it is truly the only religion that is based directly, inextricably, on history. Now, he went ahead to point out that the Jewish religion is joined with that because Judaism, the Old Testament specifically, makes claims about events that happened in specific cities, specific areas, at specific times. And while there are certainly challenges, archaeologically speaking, that we haven't yet gotten the answers for, that doesn't mean they did not happen. Archaeological discoveries are being made constantly to validate the Old Testament history. Are you aware of the fact that they've now located the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Not where they were long thought to exist, but at, an, at a different place. But the evidence is almost overwhelming that they have found the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They found the evidence of the destruction and on and on and on it goes. So Christianity, like Judaism, is a religion that is based upon historical realities. You know, it, it's fascinating to me. And Bart Ehrman, in his book, Did Jesus Exist? Now, you got to remember, Bart Ehrman is, in, in his own self-described de definition, an agnostic leaning toward atheism. And yet he addresses the issue of whether or not Jesus was an actual historical individual. Contra, I, say, I started to say so many uh, people, there aren't all that many, but there are some who claim that Jesus never existed. That view did not exist at all until the 18th century. Now, by the way, some claim that about preterism. Simply not true. Simply not true. But Ehrman makes the following observation in regard to the historicity of Jesus and even the New Testament to a certain extent. Now, make no mistake, Ehrman believes there are mistakes in the New Testament. But one of the things that he does point out is that skeptics have said for years it was a major claim. The city of Nazareth never existed. It was part of the overall myth about Jesus. It was literally invented. No such place existed. Well, then they found a little bit of archaeological evidence, and so some commentators, as a matter of fact, I was reading a commentator just yesterday, New International Greek Testament Commentary, you know, written in the 90s. And it said, if Nazareth existed, it was a really, really, really small place. You couldn't even call it a city. Well, guess what? Just within the last 10 years or so, archaeological evidence has been found to absolutely confirm Nazareth not only existed, it was a city of over a thousand people. It was a devoutly Torah observant city. So my point is this. 
When Jesus said, if I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. You see, that applies to the overall story of Jesus. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if Jesus didn't exist, we have no business believing in a non-existent Son of God. Hello. <laughs> But the reality is that archaeologists are finding more and more and more evidence all of the time to confirm the reality that Jesus really existed, that he really is who he said he is, and that therefore he did what he said he was going to do. Listen, this entire field of eschatology is directly interrelated with the historicity of Jesus, obviously. One skeptic recently said, it doesn't matter if Jesus really did raise from the, rise from the dead. If he didn't come back in the first century, then he's still a failed prophet. Uh, I don't know how you could make a more ridiculous argument. I mean, let's face it. If Jesus could raise himself from the dead, that would prove that just as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus of the, of the lineage of David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection out from among the dead. So you're telling me that someone who could raise himself from the dead, for crying out loud, wouldn't have the ability to fulfill his word, to come in judgment in the first century? Uh, look, coming in judgment pales in significance to being able to raise yourself from the dead. Don't you think? And so the illogic of the skeptics is somewhat, uh, sometimes overwhelming, to be honest about it. So anyway, got to get back to our discussion of the Kairos, the appointed time of the end the divinely appointed time of the end. We've been examining Daniel chapter 9, 24 and following. Even though the word kairos, divinely appointed time, does not appear in Daniel chapter 9, the concept most assuredly does, as I've been sharing with you over the last several weeks. Because Daniel was told 70 weeks are determined, and that literally means cut out. Here's the overall flow of history, and God looked at the flow of history and said, from here to here is the determined time for the fulfillment of six constituent elements. Those elements included to put away sin, to make the atonement. We've examined what that means, and we've shown how Jesus appeared at just the right time, the kairos. So here is the cutout time which obviously means the appointed time, for the accomplishment of certain things. And Jesus appeared at just that right time, at the divinely appointed time. Now, we've come to the third element of Daniel chapter 9, and over the last two weeks, we've taken a brief look at what it means. Seventy weeks are determined to finish the transgression. As I pointed out last week, to finish the transgression from from Tertullian, even some earlier than that, to Jerome, even to modern-day commentators, we are told that what that means, that term, finish the transgression, means to fill up the measure of sin. I've shown you how that even in the Old Testament, we, we find predictions of the last days. You know, in other words, this is remarkable. I had someone denying the reality that the new heaven and new earth has arrived. And look, I hear all sorts of comments. I read all sorts of comments. Well, we're, if we're in the new creation, this is pretty sorry stuff, which shows an utter lack of appreciation for the work of God. You know, Paul said, writing to the Corinthians, if any man is in Christ, he is a new, cre he is new creation. Well, he was writing to human beings who were still living in the midst of a world that was beset by evil, corruption, injustice, immorality. But he said, if they were in Christ, 
in Christ is the key term, then they are a new creation. Yet they could look around them and say, well, what has God changed? I still see corruption outside. But you see, they're in Christ where none of that can affect them. None of that can affect us. It cannot take away from the love of God for those who are in him. Period. End of story. Fantastic news. We have in Christ a new creation. We have in Christ a sanctuary. I love the term. A sanctuary from all of the evil and the corruption that is in the world. So that nothing present or future, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 8, 32 to 34. So this concept of finishing the transgression, you see, is all interrelated with the time of the end the time of the end being the time of the new creation. So this particular individual was denying that the new creation has come. It's yet future, he was insisting. So I pointed out that, well, okay, Peter was anticipating the fulfillment of the old covenant promises made to Israel concerning the new heaven and the new earth. The Old Testament prophecies of the coming of the new creation, new heaven, new earth, are found in Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, Specifically, others certainly talk about it, but none as graphically and explicitly as Isaiah 65 and 66. And here's the point. In both Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, the new creation, are you following me here? This is the challenge of Christ. And let me give one additional bit of information here. If you are putting the new heaven and new earth Yet in our future, if you are anticipating the fulfillment of Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21, if you are saying that is yet in our future, then you must admit, you may not like it, okay? You may never have seen it, all right? But here's the reality of what I pointed out to this individual. The reality is that in both Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, the new heaven and the new earth, which is part of the challenge of Christ, isn't it? Christ was going to come in the first century and bring in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, if you're looking for a literal, physical, material heaven and earth, then pretty clearly he didn't come and bring that. But watch this. Once again, in Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, the new creation, the new heaven and new earth would only come, but it would come when Old Covenant Israel was destroyed. Now, this individual came back, thought he had completely, utterly destroyed my argument, and he said, Preston, you're not observing the context. It wasn't Israel that was to be destroyed in Isaiah 65, 66. Israel had already been destroyed 721 BC. It was Old Covenant Judah. Well, he's obviously correct. That's not the point, is it? As I pointed out, you are correct. It was not the 10 northern tribes that were predicted in Isaiah 65, 66 to be destroyed. It was Judah. That doesn't change my argument even one bit. Let's just change up the terminology and make it more specifically accurate. The new heaven and new earth, predicted in Isaiah 65 and 66, would come at the time of the fulfillment of Isaiah 65 and 66. But the new heaven and new earth of Isaiah 65 and 66 would come at the time of the destruction of old covenant Judah. Therefore, if you or I put the fulfillment of Isaiah 65 and 66, and thus 2 Peter 3, thus Revelation 21, in our future, then we must take the position that, guess what? 
Old Covenant Judah has not yet been destroyed. Oh, listen, wait a minute. Uh, anybody that knows anything whatsoever about history knows Old Covenant Judah and Jerusalem was utterly, totally destroyed in AD 70. I'm sorry, it's simply undeniable. So when I pointed out that this gentleman's objection goes up in flames, loses any significance, any bearing whatsoever on the subject, he literally dropped the discussion. Sorry, folks, you cannot argue that Isaiah 65, 66 is yet future without thereby logically, textually, contextually demanding that the destruction of Old Covenant Judah has not yet taken place. Because Yahweh said in Isaiah 65, 12, 13, the Lord God will slay you and call his people by a new name. Sorry, that happened in AD 70, and it is absolutely unavoidable. So to continue, that new heaven and new earth would come when Old Covenant Judah was destroyed. When and why would Old Covenant Judah be destroyed? Well, because the Lord said in Isaiah 65, verse 6, your sins and the sins of your fathers will a measure into your bosom. What does that mean? Well, loophole, young, other commentators point out, it is a prediction of the filling up of the measure of Israel's sin that would lead to their total destruction. Now, you got to grab hold of this. You really got to catch the power of this. Okay? Judah was not completely destroyed in 586 B.C. Judah was not completely destroyed at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes in 164 or 168 or 170 A.D., wherever you'd like to date that. No, she was not slain. Not like, and uh, to continue, a new people was not created with a new name. Isaiah 65 was not fulfilled either in the Babylonian captivity or under Antiochus Epiphanes. So here we have a prediction of the new creation, which is all about the parousia of Christ. It is the coming of Christ at the time of the judgment to bring in the new creation. So here we have, this is incredible. Here we have the prediction of the Although, although the coming of the Lord is not mentioned in Isaiah 65, it most assuredly is in Isaiah 66. The Lord will come in flaming fire with his mighty angels to judge the world. Okay. So we have in Isaiah 65 and 66 the coming of the Lord. Remember, Jesus said his coming to judge the world was going to be in the first century. And that judgment would occur at the time of the destruction of Old Covenant Judah. Now, here's the question for the challenge of Christ. <laughs> Isaiah posits that at the time of the filling up of the measure of Judah's sin, resulting in Judah's destruction. So the question is raised naturally, logically, contextually, did Judah fill up the measure of her sin in the first century, and was Judah destroyed in the first century? Well, look, if Isaiah could look down through the stream of time and see that Judah would fill up the measure of her sin, and that Judah would be destroyed at a given period of time, don't you think that the resulting new creation would come into being, would come into reality, fulfilling the challenge of Christ? At the, pardon me, at the time when Israel filled the measure of her sin and was destroyed in the first century, now we know without any question whatsoever, is Judah filled up the measure of her sin in the first century. Judah was destroyed in the first century in AD 70. Therefore, the challenge of Christ was met. 
Jesus kept his word. You see, the only thing that keeps us from accepting this, ladies and gentlemen, is our concept of the nature of the new heaven and the new earth. But wait a minute. If Isaiah, to reiterate, if Isaiah was able to look down through the stream of time, 600 years away, and to predict the filling up of the measure of sin, and to predict the destruction of Judah, how could the third element that, of that prophecy not come to pass? He's batting two out of three for crying out loud. <laughs> and once again, the only reason, the only basis, the only justification for rejecting that is to say, well, look, I don't see a literal physical new heaven and new earth around here, so the prophecy failed. Do you see that the prophecy of the filling up of the measure of sin was fulfilled in the first century? Uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Do you see that Judah was destroyed in the first century? Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of undeniable historically. Yeah, it is. So maybe, just maybe, your concept of the new heaven and the new earth might be wrong. And that is driven home by the fact that Isaiah was told, for behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former, the former what? Heaven and earth shall not be remembered. Well, that word remember there is from the Hebrew word zakar, and it means to bring to covenantal remembrance. In other words, this old creation this old heaven and this old earth that was to be destroyed was a covenantal existence, was a covenantal heaven and earth. Well, what, what heaven and earth existed but would be destroyed? Well, in Isaiah 51, 5 and 6, the Lord said, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and to the earth beneath. These shall perish, but my righteousness will continue forever. That's Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall never pass away. Whoops. Hello. Jesus is drawing directly on Isaiah 51, 5 and 6. Now watch this. Isaiah 51, 15 and 16. I am the Lord your God who parted the seas. Hmm. What's that a reference to? Well, you know what it's a reference to. The Exodus. So here is Yahweh saying, I am the Lord your God. Remember what I've done for you in the past and remember what I will do for you in the future. I have put my words in your mouth and established them in your heart that in order that I might plant the heavens and establish the earth. What? God said, I've put my word in your heart and on your lips to create heaven and earth. Uh, he's talking to Israel. Physical heaven and earth had, had existed long millennia before God created Israel. But God said he put his word in the heart of Israel. Now, some, some take this as futuristic of the new creation. I'm fine with that. But what it still does, it shows us the covenantal identity of this heaven and earth that would be created. Not physical heaven and earth. Folks, this is the challenge of Christ. Jesus is saying there was a, there was a creation, a heaven and earth that was going to pass away, just like Isaiah 51, 5 and 6 says it would. Well, what heaven and earth was going to be destroyed? Well, it was a, it was a heaven and earth that was covenantal. For behold, I create new heaven and earth, and the former, former heaven and earth, 
will not be remembered, will no longer be covenantally significant. No longer covenant, covenantally abiding. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words will create a new heaven and a new earth, a covenantal heaven and a covenantal earth. Folks, that's basically undeniable from Isaiah chapter 25. I'm sorry, 51. And we've got to deal with these passages. So here is Isaiah 65. The new creation would come when Israel filled up the measure of their sin. Your sins, the sins of your fathers, will I measure into your bosom. God said at the time of leading to and as a, as a cause of the destruction of Judah and the creation of the new creation, Israel would fill up the measure of their sin. Well, let's see. And boy, I'm almost out of time, so I'll only be able to introduce a few passages on the concept of the filling up the measure of sin that would lead to the new creation in today's video. Isaiah 65, 66 is sufficient, okay? But let's look at a few passages from the ministry of Jesus and specific, specifically from his parables. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus told the parable of a certain nobleman who had a great vineyard. And he led it out to husbandmen, to workers, to vineyard keepers. When the time of the harvest came, he sent out his laborers or sent out his servants to gather the harvest. The workers of the vineyard, the ones who had taken care of it, so to speak, beat those servants mistreated them repeatedly. And so the Lord said, the master of the vineyard said, well, I will send my son to them. Surely they will honor him. Surely they will reverence him. But th those wicked husbandmen said, ah, here is the son. Let us kill him and take the vineyard for ourselves. They filled up the measure of their sin. And next week, I'll show you what would happen when the Lord would come. I'll see you then.